So uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming to this talk. Uh, by the end of this talk, I hope to have convinced you that uh, contrary to popular belief, we can indeed uh, formally prove properties about aggressively optimized crypto code, uh, and we can do that without expending an unreasonable amount of effort. Okay? Uh, this is a truly a team effort. In fact, people from five different institutions had to come together to make sure that this work sees the light of the day. So today, much of our security infrastructure relies on cryptography. And so given the importance and the widespread use of cryptography in several different applications, uh, we would like crypto libraries or any crypto implementation to have uh, to satisfy three basic requirements. We would, we would like these implementations to be correct. That is, we want the code with all of its implementation and the details to uh, mathematically be proven to match a specification. Uh, and ideally, that would be done using tools like uh, Conk, uh, Daphne, uh, ACL2, or any other verified tools or verification tools. We also want these implementations to be provably secure. That is, they should not leak secret information like keys or plain text messages. And this is different from security in that sense. And in addition to these two, we also want these implementations to be fast or at least aggressively optimized so that they can run as fast as possible on different platforms. The problem, however, is that in reality, achieving all three goals is a genuinely hard problem. And I'll talk about some of the specific reasons for this in just a minute, but the end result is that we often have either fast but non-verified crypto or verified but slow crypto. And uh, just to illustrate that point, here's a quick comparison between OpenSSL, which is not a verified implementation, versus a couple of verified implementations of SHA-256. Now, this is comparing time or latency, so lower is better. And uh, this is, in fact, showing for SHA-256, but the general conclusion often holds for other verified versus non-verified implementations as well, which is that there exists this substantial performance gap between uh, verified implementation I'm sorry, verified implementations and non-verified implementations. Now, part of the reason is that non-verified implementations are often heavily optimized, and so the code gets mangled, and it's no longer easy to prove a direct equivalence between the optimized code and the verified code on, or the specification. But in the case of OpenSSL in particular, there's something interesting happening over here, and here's a quick example. So this shows uh, a portion of the OpenSSL assembly code for SHA-256, where there is a Perl function uh, that is generating the assembly code. So there is the code variable uh, which contains the string of the assembly program that is to be generated. Uh, not only that, you have the, the string itself contains preprocessor macros for selecting instructions based on uh, either the platform, like in this case ARM architecture 7 and beyond, or in some cases even uh, code specialization. So if the last iteration of SHA-256 requires, let's say, a special sequence of instructions, then that is also selected using these preprocessor macros. Now, that's not all. There are more such cases, in fact. Uh, so over here, you have the same Perl function from earlier being called within a loop. So that, that code concatenation now happens multiple times, 16 times to be precise. So that code is now concatenated those 16 times to create a, to create a giant block. Not only that, the argument to that Perl function, v, is actually a Perl array uh, containing names of registers. And those uh, registers, that Perl array is actually modified using these pop and unlink operations. And the reason for doing this is to reduce the number of register to register moves across iterations. So when you go from one iteration to next, the output should not have to be copied back into the input registers as such. So there are more such performance tricks, but I'll get to the key point, which is that code ends up looking like this which is hard to read, understand, and debug, let alone verify. And that is bad because many of these implementations are used in mission-critical environments, and we want a stronger guarantee. Okay? And in fact, in the rest of this talk, I'll be showing you a way to write much cleaner code than this, which can work just as fast, if not faster, uh, uh, and which is also formally verified. And we do that using our framework called Whale, which is, for, which is basically a framework for writing provably correct, provably secure, and aggressively optimized crypto code. Okay? So uh, the, heart of, uh, the key point about Whale is a flexible syntax. The, the syntax itself supports instructions or semant uh, sorry, syntax for expressing not just functionality, but also optimizations within the same language itself. And that flexibility helps us to generate high-performance code. So in fact, code generated by Whale matches, or in some cases even exceeds, the performance of OpenSSL code. 
And most importantly, uh, code generated by Whale can be verified to be correct and to be secure from buffer overflows and from side channels. Now, I should mention that Whale is not a complete replacement to OpenSSL. It's still a work in progress, but we do take some key crypto algorithms uh, which are also available in OpenSSL and demonstrate it as a proof of concept. Okay? So to give you a flavor of what Whale looks like, here are some of the key language constructs. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but hopefully this will give you an idea. Okay? So at the heart of Whale are assembly instructions, and these instructions correspond directly to the target platform's ISA. So there are separate instructions for x86, separate instructions in Whale for ARM, and so on. But in addition to these two, Whale also supports uh, uh, syntax or constructs for structured control flow, so like if, while, and procedures. The main benefit of having these structured control flow constructs is that it now enables compositional verification. So instead of, so you can now verify properties or formally prove properties about smaller portions of the code at a time instead of being forced to verify or prove properties about giant blocks of code. And that makes verification easier. But in addition to these two, Whale also supports a couple of optimization constructs. And in fact, there are these two optimization constructs which are sufficient to express many of these optimiz or all of the optimizations in OpenSSL, which are expressed using ad hoc Perl, uh, C preprocessor macros, and uh, custom interpreters. In particular, Whale supports uh, inline if statements. So these are different from the regular if statements that I talked about earlier. And the key difference is that inline if statements are evaluated during code generation as opposed to code execution. And so this allows you to customize the operation of the code generator. Okay. So you can use these inline if statements for selecting, for applying target dependent optimizations like instruction selection based on the platform's capabilities. Like for instance, if the underlying platform supported native instructions for x86, then you would be able to select those sequence of instructions using uh, that condition. Or you could use them for platform independent purposes like loop and rolling or code expansion. And just to make that a little more concrete, here's an actual example of Whale code. So here we have the increment by n procedure, uh, which accepts an argument n, which happens to be, one, to be 100. And that argument n is used inside an inline if statement, which uh, calls the add instruction and also calls recursively calls itself. And it does that n minus 1 times. Now, the key point over here is that that inline if statement is evaluated during code generation. And so this block of code gets expanded into 100 different add veil instruction. And notice over here that there is no procedure on the right hand side. And that's because procedures are basically a logical construct in veil. And uh, for performance reasons, as is the case with many high performance crypto implementations, all procedures are actually inlined during code generation. And so when the code on the right hand side gets lowered into assembly, you basically have 100 different add instructions uh, at the assembly level. So the, this code on the right-hand side can be expressed in a compact form on the left-hand side. And that, in fact, that compact form also aids in verification. It's much easier to verify the smaller portion of the code. And you have these two levels, okay? The meta language for expressing code generation and a sequence of constructs for expressing the functionality. So that actually helps uh, to generate fast code or code that matches or exceeds the performance of OpenSSL. But remember, our goal is to also show that the code is correct um, or that it matches a specification. And for that, Whale uses a proof assistant. So the main idea is like this. You have the Whale code, which accepts some crypto code written in the Whale language. And the specification uh, is passed to the proof assistant. The developer may also have to add lemmas, which are intermediate proof steps to show that the code matches a specification. And then the proof assistant emits uh, whether the code, whether the proofs are correct or not, when whether the code is verified. Uh, now, remember over here that we are operating at the level of assembly instructions. And so the, the proof assistant needs to know about registers, instructions, and uh, uh, addressing modes. And that is supplied using the machine semantics. In fact, the, the key reason for keeping these machine semantics separate from the Whale tool itself is that if we had to add a new instruction support, for instance, or new ISA support like RISC-5, we wouldn't have to fundamentally change Whale itself. We would just have to add these new definitions as part of the machine semantics. Now, in our implementation, we use the Daphne program verifier, which is actually a, um, which is a Z3 SMT solver-based program verifier, and it has its own programming language. And uh, uh, but in principle, we never had to modify Daphne. So any other proof assistant could work just as well. 
So the same AST that is passed as the abstract syntax tree, which is passed as input to the verifier, is actually forwarded then to an assembly printer, which then prints the code in either the GNU format or the Microsoft assembly format. The assembly printer itself is executable Daphne code. Now, although there are multiple blocks over here, not everything falls into the trusted computing base. In fact, we can separate things out. So we do trust the verifier, the assembly printer, and the assembler itself. But then the AST, the proofs, and the handwritten libraries don't need to be trusted because they are verified by the verifier. And most importantly, the Veil tool itself is untrusted. Uh, and so any bugs in Veil during code generation or any of the proofs, for instance, if they're incorrect, then those will be caught by the program verifier, which in this case happens to be Daphne. So the way all of this translates into developer effort is that the developer has to express pre and post conditions similar to horror triples. So the developer expresses preconditions using the requires keyword. And on the right hand side is the same code from earlier where we are incrementing a specific register value by n. So the precondition on the right hand side uh, states that the register R5 should not overflow once you add the n value to its existing uh, value. <laughs> The post conditions uh, are expressed using ensures clause, which on the right hand side states that if this procedure executes and if the precondition holds, then the new value of R5 should be the old value of R5 plus N. And in addition to these two, Veil we'll also requires adding uh, any modifications or specifying any modifications to the machine state made by the procedure. So the modifies keyword over here says that the R5 is the only register among all registers and memory locations which gets updated by the specific procedure. So stitching together these preconditions, post conditions and modifications lets you prove, oh, I should, sorry, I should mention that uh, the code, uh, all of these pre and post conditions are actually verified before the expansion using inline if. And that helps, as I'll show later on, to unroll the code or expand the code uh, fewer times or more number of times without having to fundamentally re-verify the code after you unroll it. So stitching together these pre and post conditions lets you prove the equivalence between the specification and the implementation. But there is one more goal left, which is to show that the code is secure. And what I mean by this specifically is that uh, we need to make sure that the code does not leak secrets through either digital side channels or side channels in general or through the program state. So what I mean, so we're, we're concerned over here about digital side channels in particular because digital, digital side channels, which are side channels at the level of the microarchitecture and above, including caches, timing, branch predictors, and so on, those often can be launched remotely. And so we do want to protect against those especially. And uh, residual program state basically states that if or whenever the program terminates, it should not leave any secret information in the registers or uh, the memory locations other than the output. So in the, inter in the interest of time, I won't talk about the residual program state. The analysis is very similar to the one for digital side channels and the details are in the paper. But as far as side channel analysis are concerned, we can basically model the program execution as some crypto program which takes in some inputs. It takes in some secret inputs and some public inputs, produces some output, but it also produces certain side channel observations. And if we want to show that the, there is no secret information leakage, then we want to be able to show that there is no correlation between either the, between the secrets and the side channel observations. Now, one way to do that would be to have this crypto program being supplied with two different secret values, and then we compare the corresponding side channel observations. If the side channel observations are the same, even when the secret values themselves are different, then we, would have, then we would have shown that the side channel observations are independent of the secret values. To put that in a little more formal context, this is a specification based on non-interference that for any given crypto program C and for all pairs, all potential pairs of secret values, S1 and S2, and for all uh, potential public values, we want to show that the observations, the side channel observations, when you run the program with inputs P and S1, are the same as the observations when you run the program with P and S2 as its inputs. The problem with this scheme, however, is that formally proving this property for every single crypto code separately is an extremely tedious process. This is in fact documented by some of the previous work as well about the amount of work that is involved in proving this. And so in our implementation, we uh, use verified analysis and the main concept is like this. You, uh, you can write simple, straightforward, and cheap static analysis in the language of the prover itself, of the program verification. So in this case, uh, we can write this AST analyzer or the code analyzer in the Daphne programming language. 
uh, and the key advantage of this is that we don't have to have a custom action or a custom proof for every single code or every single AST separately. This can operate on any AST at a time. And more importantly, we can, since we are operating within the Daphne framework, we can prove the analyzer's code to be correct based on a specification. And so we can correspondingly trust the output. So we would, we would have the same soundness guarantee as we did with a formal proof of the code. But in this case, we have a much cheaper implementation in terms of the code analysis. And there's also an additional benefit, which is that it's only a one-time effort as far as the proof work is concerned. We don't have to prove this property separately for every single crypto code or crypto implementation. And so we use this in our work for implementing a verified leakage analyzer, uh, which finds out if there is leakage through digital side channels. And it just can operate on any AST. Um, uh, and we use it for different ASTs in general. So the way this leakage analysis works is actually it uses standard taint propagation rules. It uses both explicit flow and implicit flow rules. So as the first step, the developer marks all locations which contain public information and the analysis finds the complement of that, uh, which is all locations which may contain potentially secret information. The analysis then propagates this information through different registers and memory locations. So in this case, R5 is equal to secret plus one. And so R5 gets marked as secret as well. And uh, at any point in time, if the secret happens to be used in a branch predicate, a memory address, or an input to a variable latency instruction, then the analysis marks this as a problem because now the adversary would be able to observe differences in the side channels based on some secret value. Okay. Now there is one, in, in, in many of these code analysis, there is, there is one key step which is important for getting the analysis results right, and that is, making sure that your results are correct with respect to ADSing. And to understand that, consider these instructions. So in the first case, we are storing zero into a location that is pointed to by the RBX register. And in the second instruction, we are loading that same location and storing the value back into RCX. The problem, however, is that in between, there is another instruction which stores 10 into a location that is pointed to by RAX. And so the question, and so, so the result that is RCX containing zero or 10 depends on whether RAX is equal to RPX. If they were equal, then the value would be overwritten. And so this is in general a recurring problem to solve. It's a hard problem to solve, especially at the assembly level, because uh, at the assembly level, you don't have type information from the compiler. And so there exist various different approaches, but they are not without drawbacks. You could either implement uh, alias analysis or pointer analysis at the compiler level, or at the source code level, but then the compiler itself may introduce new side channels. And so you can't necessarily trust the results from the compiler analysis. You could implement pointer analysis at the, um, at the assembly level, but then that's often expensive and imprecise. Or you could basically assume that there are no aliases, but that's a very unsound assumption to make, especially when you're dealing with security of the code. And so, in fact, Vale is suited to a different approach, which is to reuse effort from the correctness proofs of the code. And to understand that, consider the specification. So let's say if the specification said that the output should be equal to zero, then the developer would have to precisely show as part of the functional verification effort or as part of the correctness effort that the RAX value should not be equal to RBX. And so this, this proof of correctness already requires the developer to do the groundwork of identifying all the precise information flows. And so we basically asked the developer to reuse or uh, give us or uh, supply us all of that information in the form of these annotations. So for every memory operand in the program, like in this case, the RDX register is dereferenced, we require the developer to add annotations as either, as either public or secret. And these annotations now get translated through other registers or memory, uh, other registers or uh, flags in the code. Most importantly, however, these annotations are not trusted because they are verified by the verifier. So even if the developer were to get these wrong, they would be caught either during functional verification, that is a proof of correctness, or during the leakage analysis part. So being able to specify these, uh, being able to check this program for leakage lets us show that the program is secure as well. And so that achieves our three goals. But um, so yeah, so in the remaining time, I'll be talking about some of our case studies. So we took four existing crypto algorithms, widely known crypto algorithms, and ported these to use with, or and sorry, coded them to use with Vail. Two of these were ported from OpenSSL, and we found problems in both of them. 
uh, in the first case there was uh, leakage, the residual program state was being uh, left on the stack even when the program terminated and in the other case we were able to confirm a previously known bug. And after fixing these two problems, all four programs were shown to be correct and secure using Whale. Now I won't go into the details of each of these, but I'll talk about the key takeaways from these, uh, which is that oftentimes the, the proof effort in terms of the specifications and lemmas that had to be added by the developer were reusable across architectures. And so it reduced the amount of proof burden, especially when proving the same implementation to be correct across implementations. Uh, across architectures. And secondly, perhaps the hardest part in porting that OpenSSL code to Whale was understanding some of the implicit uh, inherent uh, invariants that the developers had expressed when writing these optimizations. Now, thankfully, the use of Z3 helped because uh, Z3 was able to show that, uh, Z3 was able to prove these um, assertions without us having to manually write a proof for each of them because Z3 as an SMT solver is fairly uh, well developed. So here's uh, the comparison of throughput between OpenSSL and Whale. So this is throughput, so higher is better. And in this case where we're comparing 64-bit assembly code, 64-bit x86 assembly code, we find that Whale's performance is similar to that of OpenSSL. And this is not surprising considering that we basically ported the OpenSSL code into Whale and uh, made it work. So. Uh, but then if you look at other uh, implementations, like in this case, Poly1305, where we're comparing non-SIMD 64-bit code, Whale's performance is actually better for higher input sizes. And that's the primary reason over here is that the Whale implementation is a complete assembly or a complete Whale implementation as opposed to a mix of C and assembly, which is the case with OpenSSL. If you compare uh, AES128, uh, CBC mode, then a similar story holds as well that for higher input sizes, Whale's performance is better. But the main reason over here though is that as developers, we were able to aggressively unroll the loop, uh, which was not the case with OpenSSL. In, in the case of OpenSSL, for instance, if you had to do the same thing, then you would have to re-verify the code. But in our case, since verification happens before this inlining or inline if statements get expanded, we're able to verify once and then unroll it as many or as few times as necessary. Now, early on, at the very beginning, I made this claim that uh, all of these statements, all of these uh, formal verification properties can be proved without expending too much of an effort. And here's some quick empirical evidence. So this is comparing uh, the, the amount of effort that we had to impl uh, spend in order to implement the tool and, these implement and the algorithms. So developing the tool itself took a substantial amount of time, but then verifying or implementing these algorithms and proving them correct was much smaller compared to some of the amount of time that has been shown in related work. So uh, Whale is actually part of a much bigger project called Project Everest, where the fundamental goal is to deploy a fully verified HTTPS stack. And Whale's contribution is along the lines of verifying these crypto algorithms but there's also ongoing work on other components as well. So the TLS 1.3 record layer has been verified and there's ongoing work on verifying X.509 and the TLS 1.3 uh, handshake protocol. The, the team is also participating in standardization efforts of TLS 1.3. But the, the goals of Everest are to not just prove the security of these protocols, but also to make sure that the uh, the verified implementations and non-verified implementations don't have a substantial difference in performance gaps and uh, to also defend against more advanced uh, side channel, uh, more advanced threats like side channels. So in conclusion, uh, Whale is a framework for writing provably correct, provably secure and uh, aggressively optimized code for arbitrary architectures. The, the key point about Whale is the flexible syntax, which makes it possible to write uh, cleaner code, which still achieves the, the performance goals. Whale, since it operates in the framework of the verifier, it allows us to write verified analysis like we did with the information flow analysis. And finally, and most importantly, the, the, the key point here is that Whale demonstrates that verified code can be just as fast, if not faster, than existing non-verified but aggressively optimized crypto code. So as part of future work, we do plan to apply this uh, framework to other crypto implementations as well, beyond just the ones that I talked about. And there's also ongoing work on porting Whale to other proof assistants, including FSTAR. 
So with that, I'll conclude and be happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. Sir. Thanks for your talk. I'm really glad to see tools like this. Thank you. This is great. Um, on 47. 47. Flip yeah. back. Do, 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 do. Yes. So it's at least a little bit disturbing that there are such huge error bars on a constant time algorithm. Uh, yes, but so the the running time, so let me put it this way. So the amount of time taken by an algorithm depends, or it could depend on the inputs, but it could also depend on factors which are orthogonal, like let's say noise on the specific machine. Uh, now this is a constant time implementation because we verified this using our leakage analyzer. But then, uh, and this is hard to attribute exactly because we don't know what else was running on that machine because this was running on a cloud instance and perhaps there were other uh, other instances of running on the physical machine perhaps which made that so difference. It's just yeah. Noise in your yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's our speculation. But it has at least based on the machine model, we were able to prove that this is a constant time implementation using the leakage analysis. Yeah. Hi, uh, Hugo Vincent from ARM. Really, really nice work. Super Thank excited you. to see this. Um, just wondering, how do you capture the machine semantics? And, uh -huh. and also, how do you capture different microarchitectural differences on the right. same architecture, like on v 7 for example? So, uh, so you would, so I'm just trying to frame it in a way. So, I, I, it wouldn't be correct to say that we have the same definition for side channel leakages that is consistent across microarchitectures because what could be constant time on one microarchitecture may not be constant time on a different microarchitecture. So it is true that the machine semantics or in some sense the microarchitecture model of what constitutes as a side channel observation and what does not constitute a side channel observation is a part of uh, veil or it's supplied to the leakage analysis so that it can make a decision. Uh, the, the decision as to what to include for each specific architecture is kind of based on what the published research has talked about. So, uh, you know, branches uh, may cause, so if you have an if statement for instance that would have a branch and that branch predicate should be independent of the secret, the memory address um, should be independent of the secret and so, you know, so, so that is the sort of the driving factor. There's also a third bit, which is perhaps the most interesting, which is variable latency instructions. Mm -hmm. And the existing literature isn't really, I mean, we don't have open source definitions of the microarchitecture, for instance, so we can't say with conviction. But then going by what the published research talks about, which is that you have division or floating point instructions which have these variable latencies, that is what we use in this work to supply. Now that said, it's a customizable definition, so it, it, I don't think it should be too much of a difficulty to add new elements to that definition. Thanks. Sure, you're welcome. Cool, very nice. I think even your machine architectures, machine models would be very useful to other researchers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Can I, can sure. I just quickly ask, is this also, uh, all the examples you gave were symmetric keys? Are you, Sorry, were, were, were all the examples you gave were symmetric crypto? Uh, are you also doing public key crypto? Uh, no, we don't have, I, so I wish I could answer better, but considering that so many people have worked on this, I don't have, a, I mean, perhaps if you stick around for just a five more minutes, I can talk to some of my co-authors and okay. have, uh, yeah. All right, great. Um, so thanks a lot. Sure, thank you.